Next speaker is uh, Matthew Theobald. Matthew has spent around 20 years um, in project management and uh, in all sorts of different environments and different areas of, of, across Europe and the UK. And um, probably about 18 months ago, um, came across NLP and uh, used a couple of the tools and techniques that I think he'll agree changed the way he's going to think about projects forever. And he's going to talk about, um, well, the title is No More Gantt Charts. So if you want to throw all of your Gantt Charts away and never use one again, then Matthew's the person to listen to. So uh, I'd like to welcome Matthew onto the stage, please. Thanks, Martin. Good morning, everyone. So, no more Gantt charts. You may be wondering how this is going to be possible. I've spent about 20 years being involved in projects. I've worked on projects that were big across many sites and countries, and also on projects that were very small, quick, and fun to do. And one thing I've noticed that most of these projects focus on is creating a Gantt chart and then letting it rule the project team religiously see a few nodding heads around the room, so I'm not alone. What I'd like to do now is to shrink the Gantt chart back down to size. I'd like to turn it into just one thing in the toolbox that the project team uses. And to do this, I'd like to share my experiences of using NLP tools and techniques. Some of the things I'm going to talk about will look familiar to you. They'll probably strike a chord. I worked in a company a while back that had a very strong project management culture. Pr planning and using project plans was everything to them. We'd have a plan in the department, and to create that plan, we would have a meeting. But before the meeting to create the plan, we would have a pre-meeting. And we ended up with three levels of planning in that organization. One was a very high-level plan that looked at the, the bigger picture. Underneath that, was a more detailed departmental plan. And underneath that, there were detailed plans for each of us working on the project that said, on a Monday you do this, on a Tuesday you do that, and so on throughout the weeks. And every week, on top of these plans, we had a Monday morning meeting that would review what we were going to do throughout the week. And when we came to a Friday, we would look back over the week and look at what we'd done. So they were incredibly focused on these Gantt charts. But my wife can actually top that. We were talking about the presentation a few days ago, and she said, well, that's okay, but actually, I've been in a much tougher situation. The place she was working at the time uh, was the sort of culture where if you did well on a project, you were put onto another project. And she did pretty well at what she was, she was good at, so she ended up being the project team representative on five projects at the same time. Each project had its planning meeting at least once a week. So it got to the stage that she was spending so much time in these planning meetings that there was no time to do the work they were talking about. And they couldn't understand why these projects took so long to make any progress. If we, if we carry on focusing on these nuts and bolts, these tasks and how we're going to do things, is it any surprise that nothing changes? The context, as we've talked about already this morning, of how we work is changing whether we like it or not. And to repeat what's already been said this morning, if you, as many famous people have said, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. But I'd like to suggest that, given that our context of work is really changing, that if you carry on doing what you always did, you're probably going to get less now than you used to by doing the same things. So perhaps it's time for us to have a way of working with our projects that's less complex, a way that actually takes account of people. The reality of project management is that it's a discipline that's been around for decades. There are bookshelves you can have full of books about how to manage projects. You can go on training courses, you can attend seminars, go to conferences, massive conferences, to talk about all the details of how you manage projects. And we're living in a world where there's much uh, increasing pressure to do more, to do things faster, to do things uh, with less resource, and for the products to last for a lot longer. 
And there's a pressure to take shortcuts, even when we know that they're going to be dangerous for us. And often, I, I, looking at projects, I see that there's more companies working together on the projects. They're working in virtual teams. A colleague of mine uh, worked in a virtual team, and he was the only person on that team from the sponsor company. Everyone else on the team, suppliers, consultants, etc., were from other companies and spread right the way across the world. So they could never come together. And people say to me that we're losing our way as we're working in projects. We're asked to get, create a document, but I don't know why it's there. And when I ask someone else why we're creating a document, they don't know either. We're creating it for its own sake. People also tell me that they're having difficulty understanding where the projects are going to, to understand what it is they're trying to deliver. A company I was involved with a while ago had a project to deliver in 18 months a new wound care product. Now, this project involved an R&D group and a marketing group. For the R&D organization, in 18 months, they saw the project just being complete when they'd got the wound care product submitted to the regulatory authorities for approval. But the marketing guys had a very different perspective. They saw that in 18 months' time, they would have products ready to go into the pharmacies, into the wholesalers, uh, ready for patients to actually use. But these two teams never talked to each other. So 18 months down the line, looking at where the project was finishing, the R&D guys sat back and said, fantastic, we've done a great job. This product is now ready. It's gone into the regulatory authority for submission for approval. The marketing guy said, what on earth's going on? We were expecting to have product to ship to our, our customers today. We've got nothing. All this marketing effort, all these people interested in the product, what have you done? It actually took this company 18 more months to fix the problems that arose. Their product went from being the first in the marketplace for that particular wound care technology to just being one of six or seven that were around. Imagine the cost in terms of lost sales. Imagine the effort that's gone into that project for very little return. And it all came down to those two teams not coming together, talking and discussing what they were seeing as the end point. Project management certainly has a lot of complex methodologies and most of them are very rigidly applied. You can get certifications in very specific methodologies. There are organizations around who will spend enormous amounts of effort and time developing these bodies of knowledge to tell you how to run a project. A, one company I had some fun with a year or two back developed a very complex but very elegant methodology. It had a number of stages from the first idea going right the way through to delivery of the project. And inside each of these steps, there were a number of micro steps and documents that were required. On paper, it looked really good. They applied this methodology to all of their projects, which was interesting given that this organization had projects ranging from simple upgrades of software on laptops right the way through to multi-site, multinational implementations of IT systems, like SAP. And they tried to apply the same methodology to all of those different scales of projects. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the project teams found their own ways to get, get through this methodology, to put the ticks in the boxes that were required whilst doing what they actually needed for their projects. And eventually, the organization woke up to this and thought, we probably could use this ourselves. Let's turn them into formal route maps to tell different types of projects how they can navigate through this, this mass of steps. They probably could have saved themselves a load of time if they'd thought about that at the beginning and made the methodology more flexible. Here's an extreme example of command and control. Picture yourself as a project manager. Imagine what it feels like when you go in front of an inquisition board for your monthly project review. When you come into the room at your allotted time, the head of the organization is sat in the middle of this big long table. You've got their leadership team either side of them, all watching what you're about to tell them. And as a project manager, you're going in there to, to present where your project's at and to justify why you've got all the problems you have. 
and they typically get beaten up if you have got problems, which most projects did have. So there was a really heavy focus in this place on these Gantt charts and the milestones that were in them. A friend of mine was working in that situation, and it, one day it occurred to him that actually there's a way he can reduce the pain he's feeling, because it was a really nasty experience every month. You get anxiety attacks sometimes beforehand. He realized that if you knew perhaps two months before a milestone was due that it was going to be late, you could move it further out to say six months from now. And when you came to the next project review, there was no, no pain. No one said, why have you moved the, the milestone? And you could carry on doing that ad infinitum and feel no pain. And this worked for his project for a while. Things became a lot calmer, they felt more relaxed. But after a short period, they realized that actually it was causing more damage than good because there was no visibility of the problems they were actually having in the project. And when they went to ask for more resource or more money, the Inquisition board quite reasonably said, you don't need it. Everything's fine, you're ahead of schedule, your milestones are all okay. He did say that some of the project managers that he knew in that organization went to great lengths to avoid going to these meetings. Some would take holiday. Others would go on training courses when this meeting was due. Some would go and visit suppliers. Some even were off sick. That's how little they enjoyed these meetings. So what makes these experiences more and more common? A few years ago, Belbin described our work environment as having three phases to it. The first phase he described as the pre-industrial phase. And this could be probably a good example of uh, crofting in the Scottish Highlands. According to the Bible story, Noah um, was given a very clear purpose for the project he undertook. It was very clearly described to him that in a set period of time, there's going to be a flood on the earth, and you need to be able to save yourselves, your family, and two of each animal from that. And he was given a very clear specification to build an ark so, so long, so big, to hold so many animals. Then we started to, to evolve and develop into the industrial stage as we started to build factories and our processes became more standardized. And the management of our projects changed too. It moved away from being about what we were doing to how we went about it and the processes we have in place. And those are the projects that I'm certainly very familiar with and maybe you are as well. We're now moving into a third phase, which Belbin has termed as the post-industrial phase. Uh, this is uh, just typified by much more flexible, agile organizations, almost high-tech crofting or cottage industries. I've been writing a book recently with a colleague based 300 miles away, and we've used this new flexibility and more agile way of working to deliver a book in just six months without having to keep driving 300 miles to have all of our meetings. We've done it in six months instead of the year or two years it would typically take. So we've got the methods. We've got processes that tell us how to do our projects. Yet 83% of our projects overrun dramatically. 83% of our projects cost far more than we planned. 83% of our projects take longer than we wanted them to. And they deliver far, far less than we originally planned to. And my projects, sorry, my projects were no different. Even with 20 years experience in being involved with projects, knowing methodologies, understanding processes, mine were right up there. I was, my projects were failing at that kind of rate. We spent some time a year, a year ago asking about 20 companies what it was that made their projects fail. It was interesting what they told us, that the projects don't fail because of documentation. Their projects do not fail because of complex and beautiful methodologies. Their projects do not fail because of processes. They fail because of people, because of how people behave when they're on projects. They fail because of how people communicate or don't. And they fail because of the relationships that people build up or don't build up when they're working in a project team. So clearly, the way we're working is changing, whether we like it or not. We're definitely moving into this post-industrial stage of quicker, leaner, more flexible working. 
we need to unravel this mess that is project management and methodologies that are stuck in the industrial stage. I believe that we cannot sustain this 83% failure rate, given this move into a different way of working. I know there's another way that we can go about it. All the projects I've worked on and talked to people about, it's clear that there are three things that make a project work. It's about, as Stephen Covey said, beginning with the end in mind. It's also about not being a project manager, moving to being a project leader, taking care of the people on the team, giving direction, providing them with the opportunity to communicate their perspectives and the issues that they have, and making sure that your goals are all the same, they're aligned together. And it's also about keeping it simple and flexible. And this is where NLP tools, I believe, have a big potential benefit to give us. All the projects we ever work on, all the methodologies I've come across, have the same three common pieces of them, the same thread that goes throughout them all. And this thread is quite simply three stages. Every project goes through discovering what, it's there, what it is they're there to do. They go through a stage of designing how they're going to meet that idea they've got. And then they go through the stage of delivering that plan. So firstly, this stage of discovery. This is the stage that most projects rush over in this real desperate need to go to planning or to going and doing something, even if that's the wrong something. This stage is all about knowing who you need to involve in the project. It's about understanding together as a team what risks you're likely to face and how are you as a group going to overcome them. It's about getting to a stage where you all have the same view of where you're heading. Now think about a project to deliver an elephant. I'd like you just to think of an elephant, if you will. What does it look like? What, what sounds do you hear? Well, we all know what an elephant looks like, don't we? So it's going to be really simple. There's no need to discuss the project. So you may have been thinking of perhaps an African elephant, maybe a fluffy toy elephant, a cartoon one, or even maybe a pink elephant with glasses. Which of these was your project just now? So perhaps given this, even with a simple question like, what does an elephant look like? It's no wonder the companies I've talked about earlier got it so wrong when they were trying to understand where they were getting to. And the second stage every project goes through is that of design. And this is about getting to a stage where you have a clear plan that's realistic and everyone believes they can achieve. It's about understanding what's worked well for projects in the past and what hasn't worked well for them and seeing which of those you can reuse or use to your benefit. It's about getting people to commit to the plan you put in place by involving them in its development. It's about checking that things make sense. That you're not rushing off in a blind alley, down a blind alley. Of course, it's about doing some planning. I was involved with a company that was embarking on their very first project. It was a very exciting time for them, a small company, 15 people. And this project was working with two other companies, one based in the US and one based at the other end of the UK, who was going to produce the product at the end of it. This was the first time any of them had worked together or done any projects. So we took the key people away from each of these three companies, locked them in a room for three days, essentially. And we spent a lot of time in that three days just talking about what the project meant for each of the companies and also for the individuals. And understood, got to point, we understood what it meant when the project was successful for everyone in that room. So we left with a really clear feeling of what it was going to be like, what it felt like when you were there, what sounds they would be hearing when they'd achieved this project successfully, and what the product would look like in the end. Once we got that really clear um, vision of where the project was going to, it was actually really simple to create the plan. One sheet of paper with the, the key tasks on one side, the people who were in the room along the top, they were able to commit to the dates they could deliver each of those tasks right there and then. That was the plan for the project. No electronics in sight. And this project actually was delivered ahead of schedule, under budget, 
and is a very successful product in the market as well. The third stage is that of delivery. So putting into action the plan you've just, put it, just created amongst your team. There's a very well-known saying that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And there's a reason why that's well-known, because it's true. Has any of you ever had a project with a plan that actually came to pass without any changes? No, it doesn't look like it. I'm not alone then. <laughs> I find it often it's very difficult to get people to attend project meetings. It's very rare when you have 100% attendance at every meeting, unless there's a big problem, an issue that needs to be sorted, and there's real pressure to get on and sort it. That's when the command and control elements really become strong. We find it's better if the team talks before we get to these crises. With a regular, regular occurrence, sitting down, having a chat about what's happening with the project, what concerns they have, what issues, and working through together to understand the different perspectives and what's going on. And the teams are much stronger and more able then to actually deal with these problems as they come up. Well, the final element of this, this project process, these three steps that every project goes through, is evaluation. Taking time to look back at the project and say, yeah, that worked well, 